Greetings from the garden of Lewis and Terry Freeman. What comes to mind when you think of God and a garden? For me, it's the parable of the sower or the garden of Eden or a song like, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. Hmm. In Isaiah 5, we read that the Lord will comfort Zion. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. Hmm. That sounds like worship to me. On this Sunday morning, I welcome you to worship. May you find comfort and joy and gladness as we worship together. And I do thank you for protecting our congregation as we watch our service digitally instead of in person. We do, however, really miss all of you. So now on behalf of our pastor, John Roy and Ashley Twitchell and me, Sam Coates, I welcome you to worship. school season, we give thanks for all who serve in the field and ministry of education. We know that we can't possibly begin to name all of the fields and the areas that go into shaping the minds of young children and youth. From preschool up through high school, even into college and graduate programs, there are so many hands and hearts involved in this field of ministry and education. And so as we say our prayers today, we are mindful to include all those who are entering into this new school year as leaders, as educators, as teachers and mentors, as administrators, and most importantly, as friends. Let us pray. No matter our age, Lord, we are your beloved children as parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, godparents and friends, we sometimes need to be reminded that you are always leading, guiding, shepherding, and loving each of us as your children. And as we begin a new school season, we are ever so mindful of the care and responsibility entrusted to us and the precious gift of children and youth. We are filled with our own excitement and anxiety, wonder and concern, growth and uncertainty. Remind us that we are not alone, that not only do you go with us, but we are also surrounded by a community to offer support, grace, patience, and reassurance. Give all educators, teachers, administrators, counselors, 
and all who serve in our schools a sense of calm strength and patient wisdom to walk alongside their students, teaching and guiding them in ways that reveal your love. Extend abundant grace in these times of constant change. We thank you for the leadership and relationships of these special people and the lives of our children and youth. We are grateful for their ministry. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My grandfather's favorite song that I learned as a child I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love, and it wrote my name above. And just a little hope with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little hope with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer will turn And you know a little fire is burning You will find a little hope that Jesus makes it bright I may have doubts and fears My eyes be filled with tears But Jesus is friend who watches day and night I go to him in prayer And he knows my every care And just a little hope that Jesus makes it bright now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our troubles. Hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer will turn, and you know a little fire is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus, makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. Joshua 4, 1 through 9. When the entire nation had finished crossing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Select twelve men from the people, one from each tribe, and command them. Take twelve stones from here, out of the middle of the Jordan. From the place where the priest's feet stood, carry them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you camp tonight. Then Joshua summoned the twelve men from the Israelites, whom he had appointed, one from each tribe. Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. And each of you take up a stone on his shoulder, one for each of the tribes of the Israelites, so that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the Ark of the Covenant of God. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the Israelites a memorial forever. And now from Exodus 20. Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. The line between remembering and worshiping is thin. The line between the human-made carved image and God-made rocks is not. I'll explain. I'll begin with the second passage. The second commandment of ten is not to make any graven image. The next verse forbids the worship of the graven image, which surely begs the question, if it is forbidden to make, why would you ever have to forbid its worship? 
Scripture, as you know, is written and edited in the past tense. The writer knows the commandment has already been broken. The writer is offering the warning, don't worship them. The issue here is we are worshiping, but it is not God. Yet you can avoid the temptation if you will just follow the previous commandment, which is not to make images, graven images. So why? Why forbid images, even images of Jehovah God? The commandment as written forbids images of anything on earth. Well, this would include people and trees and calves. Heaven above, presumably where God lived, and so this would forbid images of angels and God. And from the water, this would forbid the carved images of fish or oysters, etc. Interestingly enough, technically the author did not use the language of the sky above, so maybe ravens and eagles were okay to be carved. But if we applied common sense, it would be logical to extend the prohibition to even birds. I guess what we've learned here is God is not a lawyer, for this is a poorly written statute. Using common sense, let's conclude then that the injunction involves anything created. But to thoroughly understand this, should we limit the injunction to just carved images? Paintings would come later. Stained glass even later than that. And where would the church be without stained glass images of Jesus the Good Shepherd? I mean, in the hands of a literalist, don't make graven images or worship the graven image is a dangerous commandment for America. I mean, the Statue of Liberty would be fair game. The MLK Monument in D.C. as well. The Robert E. Lee Monument at Gettysburg would be a violation of this. Mount Rushmore. Even the Liberty Lines at the New York City Public Library. And sadly to say, even my favorite coach, Nick Saban, and his statue would be at risk. Surely if you take the Bible literally, then removing statues has to be a priority. And if you go beyond graven images and consider the intent to remove images of the created, any images, can you imagine how far this could go? I mean, any image. We'd be removing paintings of Jesus, stained glass windows. Now, from the look of things, the horse is out of the barn on this one. So we will have to live with the bad and good produced by graven and non-graven images. Now, the Jordan River Memorial is not a carved images. The stones are called standing stones. That's the story we read earlier. And standing stones are an ancient way of memorializing what God did in a certain location. Remembering what God did without giving attention to humans and without limiting God was the purpose of these natural stones. When you see the stones, you can then inquire about what it was that God did. I mean, this is from our scripture. This is to serve as a sign among you in the future. When your children ask you, what do these stones mean? You tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed the Jordan, the waters 
of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. That's Joshua 4. I hope you heard that. Tell them. Tell them. No one would mistake the stones for a graven image. Furthermore, the stones are really, at best, incomplete. They are a sign pointing to the real thing. The Hebrews understood well the weakness of the graven image is that it is a substitute for speaking. On the other hand, the stones are a prompter to speak, to tell the story of why these stones are here. Now, our garden features a sanctuary called Twelve Stones. It's underneath Rusty the Redbud tree. The importance is that the children walk by it daily. They see it, and they're learning to read. And one day they turn to their parents and they say, uh, why are those 12 stones piled up together? And you know what the parent has to do? They have to go and look it up. And then they have to tell the story. Now for myself, I'll just say when you see the 12 stones stacked together, here we have a reminder. A reminder that at this place, God visited us. We hope, we pray, when you come to the garden to pray, that you leave being visited by God. The death of Moses is recorded at the end of Deuteronomy. He ascends Mount Pisgah, and he hears from God, This is the land. It will be for you and your offspring. I have allowed you to see it but you shall not cross over. So Moses dies. Moses dies in Moab. And as the Scripture says, no one knows his burial place to this day. The greatest Jew, as the Jews tell the story, is laid to rest and no one knows where. Not only is there no graven image of Moses by the Jews, but there's not even a headstone. Walter Kaufman explained it this way. He was to die alone, lest any man should know his grave to worship there, or to attach any value to his mortal body. Having seen Egypt, Moses understood how people are too superstitious and worship monuments to what was." End of quote. You see, monuments make us consider what was when God needs us to live in the present. The Hebrews have been so diligent and faithful to the spirit of non-worship of humans. The message of Judaism is about their ideas about God and man, not about people like Moses. Moses has not been forgotten without a gravestone, has he? It's actually the opposite. Moses will never be forgotten because the only way to keep him alive is to tell his story. It seems that maybe the point to no graven image is a practical one. Once you make it, once you make an image, everybody uses their eyes. And nobody tells the story anymore. So without the graven images, you have to tell your children the story. So when you see the garden of the twelve stones, tell the story. The story of a God who would not abandon a people. A God who was with them in the desert, and with them in the promised land, and with them when they had to cross that river. This is our God with us, even now. Let us pray. God.
You made the stones we stack. What we need to remember is what you have done. Grant us a strong memory. Grant us even more reason to share our stories of your mercy. In the name of the one who is with us in the land of promise, to the wilderness, and to every stop in between, we pray. Amen. love and forgiveness you have watered pruned and nourished may we bring forth beauty and not weeds now may the god of peace himself sanctify us completely and may our whole spirit soul and body keep be kept blameless at the coming of lord jesus christ amen <laughs> 